Good afternoon and welcome to Supervisor Spotlight. I'm Angie Carpenter, Supervisor of the wonderful town of Islip. Uh, we're here in the studios of Long Island News Radio. Thanks to their courtesy, we're much appreciative of it. Um, at Long Island MacArthur Airport. And with us today, our guest is our newly elected councilman, Jim O'Connor. Jim, thank you so much for being willing to join us in the studio today. Well, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So um, Jim is new to the town board, our town board, but not town boards in the past. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the fact that you have been a town board member before and coming to the town of Islip. Tell us about your tenure prior. Uh, Back in 1997, um, I had the opportunity to run for public office. I was a lot younger and thinner and in better shape back then. (laughs) Weren't we Uh, all? 21 years ago, my gosh. 35 instead of 55. So you you have different types of energy. Uh, But I had the opportunity to run for public office and uh, thankfully was successful, served for four years uh, in North Hempstead as a councilman. And now 20 years later, uh, kind of a rising of, from the ashes, a, a resurrection. I find myself back in public service in a very similar role as a councilman in Islip. So it's, um, it's really neat. Um, you know, during the 20 years, I did a lot of different things, including uh, started my own business and founded my own law firm and, and things like that, but uh, never really gave up the, the, the thirst for public service, uh, a thirst that sometimes goes... Uh, Unfulfilled, you know, it's yep. uh, endless. So, always involved in a lot of different things, including with uh, my family and and uh, some of the things that we're involved with on a fundraising perspective and and doing things for the special needs community. Um, so, I was never really completely out of the game, but my first time back into real uh, public office in 20 years. So it's a uh, it's really kind of neat. You know, it, it, it makes me kind of smile and think to myself, uh, that term that you used, thirst for public service, you know, many of us do have it. And, you know, I never thought of it in those terms. But thinking back to my tenure and how I got involved, it was through community organizations. In fact, when we first bought our house in uh, the town of Islip. It was back 50 years ago. And I remember calling, before we made the commitment to buy the house, I called the school that my children were going to be going to. Mind you, my son was three and a half and I was pregnant with my second. And I wanted to know if this was a community that was active and involved because I wanted to be involved in the PTA and so forth. And so that goes back a lot of years ago, 50 years ago, and was PTA and scouts and everything in between and started a business myself. And there, too, Chamber of Commerce, the Long Island Association was always so super involved. So when I had the opportunity to run for public office, um, it was kind of like a natural fit. You know, people actually came to me and said, you know, why don't you run? You know, there's a vacancy. Why don't you run? And uh, it is absolutely a gift to, to have people have the confidence in you to be their voice, to represent them, you know, in government. And I think town government and having served in the county, town government is even closer to the people. Yeah. And you really get to uh, make a difference in people's lives. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know how really it started. Uh, this whole idea of public service. I think it has something to do with your upbringing. Um, Certainly. But I think also, you know, I was uh, quite infected by the Jesuits in my four years at Boston College, where they teach you know service to others above service to self. Right. And um, you know that that really took root. And I've always tried to look for ways to help. I think you get more out of it. It's than, so than, true. than anything else. I mean, I've had professional accomplishments. Uh, I've had um, won awards and all of these different things. But nothing makes you feel better than when you help someone else. It's so true. It yeah. really, it really does make that kind of difference and makes you feel good. And and people who are in, 
you know, the volunteer community, not-for-profit community will say that, you know, they get so much more out of it than they actually uh, put into it. Yeah. And we try to instill that in our youth, I think. Um, and I think in the town, we do a pretty good job of it. We have um, youth services, the youth enrichment services in particular, and many, many uh, organizations that work with youth. Obviously, the Scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, who instill that sense of community and doing for others. And uh, I think it makes the town that much better for it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So being a councilman in the town of North Hempstead, how do you um, do you see differences? I mean, Hempstead I do. I is mean, a there smaller are, town. There are similarities and differences. Um, in terms of uh, uh, being smaller, Hempstead is around 250,000 people. Islip around 355, I right. guess. Mm-hmm. So uh, bigger town and, and bigger geographically as well. But a lot of the roles are similar, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, and it's the kind of things that I think sometimes the public takes for granted. Um, you know, we expect when we wake up in the morning and we turn our light on that the lights are going to come on and we expect that the garbage is going to magically disappear. Nobody wants to know where it goes or how it gets there or any of those other things. But it all happens behind the scenes and it happens because people who are dedicated to uh, providing those types of critical services that we need in our communities just to live our everyday lives. So, you know, paving the roads and having nice parks to go to on the weekend to take your children. Those are all so important things to mm-hmm. all of us, but sometimes overlooked and sometimes taken for granted. And um, that's what town government does. I used to uh, get a kick out of our town supervisor in North Hempstead, who I serve with, uh, May Newberger, another oh, I distinguished, knew her distinguished w- women elected official, a trailblazer, really. Uh, in what she did with the environment in the New York State Assembly. But, you know, she had served in the Assembly. And so she would remind people when they would come to town board meetings, and particularly she got a pleasure out of reminding our statewide elected officials (laughs) or our federal elected officials that they were dealing with these really high, important issues that everybody was really focused on. But you you never really quite get someone's attention when you're as if when you're about to put a stop sign on their oh, front yes. lawn, yes. that really gets their attention because this is really local. Right. This is really where the uh, rubber meets the road. And, um, you know, it was um, an interesting perspective. You, you saw that. Um, the attention is sometimes in politics, uh, as we saw last night with the State of the Union, the attention is on the really high-end stuff, but a lot of the work takes place behind the scenes in the critical services that we provide to our communities. And uh, I have always been intrigued by that. And my experience in North Hempstead really whet my appetite, and I'm really excited to get back doing it some more. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And I, and I like that example that you use, that people just kind of expect things to be going along well. Um, and we had a, a case this week. We had a snowstorm, uh, kind of unexpected. It snuck up on everybody. And in the town of Islip, it went from about an inch and a half at the western end of town to about five inches in the eastern end of town. And we have a system in place where our park rangers are out there 24-7. So we knew immediately when that first snowflake hit the ground right. and could tell that this was going to be something of substance more than we had expected. Right. So at 1.30 in the morning, you know, our Activating, commissioner had yeah. them out there salting the roads and... Uh, the park rangers could tell us of areas that were particularly dicey that we could, dis, you know, uh, deploy our resources to. And, uh, you know, everybody woke up. I know I had gotten a text at 4 in the morning from the school superintendents, you know, what are the roads like? And so we had confidence that we had handled it, but it kind of happened seamlessly, you know. Yeah. Well, and, everybody thinks it's seamless. Yeah. It's really not that seamless. Not that There's seamless. a lot of work that goes into it. There's a lot of planning, a lot of training, and then you know, utilizing your people, which, uh, you know, I'm, well, I'm, I'm still note, learning. We're going to take a little bit of a break and we'll come back and talk about the intricacies of getting the simple things done in the town of Islip.
Hi there. Welcome to Supervisor Spotlight. I'm Angie Carpenter, Supervisor of the Town of Islip. We are here in the studios at Long Island MacArthur Airport, and our guest today is Councilman Jim O'Connor, the new, newest member of the Islip Town Board, and we're delighted to have you there. We were chatting before the break about um, these services that seem, seem or appear to be seamless are less than that when yeah. you think about the planning and coordination that goes into effect. And uh, we were chatting about the snowstorm that we had, and uh, I was so delighted. I was talking to the uh, Commissioner of uh, Public Works and Parks, Tom Owens, whose responsibility it is to make sure those roads are clear and safe, who said that we had only two two phone calls in about, uh, you know, not getting there soon enough. So that that's quite a mark of accomplishment, given the fact that we have 1,200 miles of road in the town of Islip to take care of, and some very hilly sections, which we tend to forget, but the areas of, of yeah. Ronkonkoma in particular, the hills of Ronkonkoma, the first time I heard that, um, it, it's amazing, yeah. you know, how hilly it is, and that does make a difference. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the first snowstorm, I guess I was on the job all of four days. Uh, <laughs> on January 4th, we had the first snowstorm, and it was interesting um, because... You know, folks, I think, have a tendency to uh, express when they're dissatisfied. Oh, absolutely. And they kind of withdraw, and they're not always so quick to tell you when you've done a good job. You're always more likely, people who work in the customer service business say, you're always more likely to hear from people when they're happy as opposed to when they're satisfied. But we were getting great reviews mm -hmm. uh, in my office, and I know throughout the town, on the wonderful job that they did with the bigger snowstorm on January 4th. Uh, that was great. It's great to hear because you don't hear, hear it yeah. often. And I think it, it really helps the morale and it really helps people who do spend, you know, nights and weekends away from their families to provide this particular service. They're compensated for it, but it's not always just about pay. No. Uh, it, it is a sacrifice. And they do that and they... Um, sometimes feel unrewarded. And when somebody uh, just expresses a simple thank you or, or a kind wave or a gesture, it really means a lot. And I think that's, uh, that's kind of neat. That was a great thing. I, I really liked seeing that, uh, you know, all of first week on the job. Well, you know, I'm so happy to hear you say that because a lot of times uh, we don't tell our employees enough, you know. Uh, they sometimes take a little bit of a bum rap uh, working in government. And uh, they are, you know, in, in a snowstorm, the guy's out there for hours, you know, plowing, and it's not easy. It's not easy work, you know. Uh, it's monotonous, and, and uh, you're trying to be careful, and a lot of times people don't heed the warnings or heed the requests that we make to get your cars off the road. That is the biggest thing. Anybody who complains about how their plowing job was not as good as they would like to be, more times than not, it was because there were cars in the road right. and they have to go around and then they have a harder time later on. And I have to tell you, um, I was driving home after one of the storms and it was about seven or eight and I felt kind of bad for this lady out in the road trying to dig her car out, yeah. except I couldn't resist the temptation. And I, you know, stopped my car and rolled down the window. And I said, you know, if you had put your car up on the grass or in your driveway the way we asked you to, you wouldn't be doing that right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and she chuckled and she said, yeah, you're right. I won't do it again. <laughs> but, <laughs> Sometimes uh, the toughest lessons are the yeah, ones we exactly, learn the hardest. Exactly. Yeah. But it, it, it does make a difference. It really does. But. The, the fact that you, you mentioned that about thanking them, and, and that's so very important. And whenever we do get letters and emails commending a particular employee, we do share that, you know, with their immediate supervisors and with personnel, and it goes a long way. It really it does. Really, really does. It really does. It really yeah. does because People like to feel appreciated, and they like to be empowered. Mm -hmm. So when you give them the opportunity to succeed, I think more often than not, they'll, they'll choose that path. Well, we're very fortunate, you know, talking about the plowing operations, we have a very coordinated effort in the town. Uh, about two and a half years ago, we combined the oversight of the Department of Public Works and the Department of Parks. They were and still are basically two separate departments, but there's one leadership team. 
And when we do have an event, very often the resources of both of those departments were put into use, but not necessarily in a coordinated fashion. And even to the point with the Department of Environmental Control, uh, you know, the garbage trucks, the trucks that we have in that division, they too will come into, you know, play uh, when there's really a big event. So um, I think that coordination is very, very important. Right. Teamwork. Teamwork. Yeah. Teamwork. Absolutely. So um, we talked about a little bit about um, the fact that North Hempstead was a smaller town than we are in Islip. Um, Governance-wise, because it was in the county of Nassau versus Suffolk, I know tax collection systems are different. Was there anything else that... What really made North Hempstead unique, I think there are, I'm trying to remember, I'm taxing my memory, but I think there are 27 villages, incorporated villages, within North Hempstead itself. So, you know, you're providing different levels of service in incorporated villages who have their own, some of their own mm-hmm. structure in place to do some of their land use and some of the, their management issues with respect to permitting processes and things like that. Uh, they also, um, I grew up in the incorporated village of Westbury. We have a wonderful mayor there, Peter Cavallero, and before that, my old basketball coach, Ernie Strada. But the incorporated village of Westbury in, in our community would take care of the trash removal. So there weren't separate garbage districts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was different. You know, we had uh, uh, different, many different layers and, and, and more layers of government. Um, sometimes people like that because they like the idea of having local control, mm-hmm. uh, but sometimes an added layer of government uh, sometimes adds to costs and burdens. Yeah. So there are strong arguments both ways. I. Um, I like when municipalities can get together and cooperate and communicate, and I know Governor Cuomo has has had a big initiative with respect to this, because I think at the end of the day, when they do that, uh, I think the taxpayer benefits. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had a great example in North Hempstead where the county and the town got together because right next to each other was a county park and a town park, and so they coordinated that and, and worked it out where there was a land transfer mm-hmm. in exchange for some road responsibilities going back and forth. I think it works out good. I mean, it was kind of silly. Could you imagine if there was a town park, a county park, and a village park all in a row? Mm-hmm. You know, it would be kind it of... It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't. It really. doesn't make sense. And I'm glad you mentioned that about the Governor's Initiative because we have been very active participants from day one on that, many, many meetings. Uh, And we were pleased because the town has exhibited that kind of intermunicipal cooperation. Uh, We have uh, agreements in place with the town of Brookhaven. Um, In uh, Smithtown, for for example, we just had our um, public safety, the public safety park rangers, the peace officer training. We did that in-house for the first time ever. And we were able to offer the services to Smithtown because they had a ranger that they needed to have trained right. and sent the ranger over here. And they were delighted. And when we had the little graduation, uh, the crew from Smithtown came over and they were most appreciative of that opportunity. But uh, in the village of Brightwaters, we sweep the streets for them. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense for a village the size of Brightwaters, who's I think they're about one square mile to have a street sweeper, have all of that equipment and personnel in place. So they contract with the town. And certainly it's going to be a lot cheaper than if they contracted with an outside private contractor to come in and do it. So it's a savings to the taxpayer. Uh, The services are still being delivered. And it helps um, address the mandate that, quite frankly, it is a mandate now that we have from the state that we engage in these kind of intermunicipal services. But there is a lot more that we could be doing on that, and uh, maybe we'll discuss that when we come back after our break. Sure. Thank you. (laughs) 
Welcome back to Supervise the Spotlight. I'm Angie Carpenter here at the studios of Long Island News Radio with our very special guest today, Councilman Jim O'Connor. Um, we were talking before the break about the governor's initiative for shared services and how the town has participated. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the fact that when you were in North Hempstead, they had 17? I think it was 27, 20, 27 or 37. 27 villages. I know. I was, was at amazing. A, <laughs> I was at a forum with Judy Bosworth, who yeah. is the supervisor now. And when she mentioned that number of villages, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, yeah. that, that's it's difficult. It's yes. really difficult. Um, you know, and one of the um, initiatives that were discussed, not too much action has happened on it, is the consolidation or the sharing of services with the school districts. And um, I know that there is some sharing through BOCES, um, and likewise the towns, we when we go to do purchasing and join purchasing, we can purchase off the state bid list or you know another town's bid list so that we are getting the best value for the taxpayer's dollar. Um, but one of the interesting concepts that has been thrown around, and I know that Marty Cantor had done a research paper on it, and that was the possibility of having townwide school districts where you would still have the identity of your community school. You'd still have the Musketeers or the Mustangs or whatever you know, your individual school identity was, and you would have the same teachers and principals and everything. But at the governance level or at the supervisory level, you know, does every single school really need to have its own superintendent and a number of deputies and so forth that at that level perhaps it could be something looked at a little bit more globally? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, when when we look um, off of Long Island, you know, we we sometimes... um, uh, we're very proud of who we are and what we are, and, and we should be. Uh, but I don't think we have any sort of ownership of of great ideas or mm-hmm. great initiatives. And and when we look elsewhere in the country, uh, they do it a little differently. Now that would probably be revolutionary mm-hmm. to talk about here on Long Island. But I think you know we need to be finding ways to coordinate mm-hmm. and cooperate and collaborate. Um, so that uh, the taxpayer, I think, gets the ultimate benefit. And it doesn't have to be draconian loss of service or loss of local control. Uh, I think of an example uh, that's close to me where you have two small school districts located right next to each other, uh, neither one able to field a football team because they didn't have enough kids anymore to play football. They combined so that the kids in both communities can enjoy a particular sport that takes place every fall and is part of the American Mm -hmm. fabric. Um, uh, And and that was a a good example uh, where uh, somebody thought a little bit outside the box and uh, got something to work amongst two neighboring Mm -hmm. communities. So um, I think we need more of that. I think so too, and I I think we can do it, and I think the time is right for that. Um, but again, people have to be willing to have the conversation. You know, I know in the town of Islip, there's a tremendous amount of cooperation amongst the various schools. Um, the superintendents have a superintendent's association, and I'm sure they do in other townships too. But these people really, you know, uh, they, they believe it. They really do it. The superintendents, the school boards, uh, they do come together and they share ideas. It's, it is very collegial. And I know that even um, in the last couple of years, um, I did reach out when I first got there as the supervisor to the superintendents and said, listen, you guys, have to, we want to work with you and let us know when you're going to close the schools. Call us first. I don't want to wait and hear it on the radio because when they're deciding how they're going to deploy the resources and where they're sending the plows, generally we send them to the schools and the hospitals first. But if you're closing, we don't need to do that. Right. You know, right away. We can go back later in the day. So they have been incredible. And I I think I referenced it earlier. I I got a text at 4 in the morning 
um, the other day when the snow was coming down, uh, that kind of collaboration, cooperation, communication is so important, and it really is at a very high level in the town. So our residents, I think, can have comfort in that. You know, yeah. there is that. Well, you know, we see it uh, every day in town service. Change is difficult for people. It is tough. And, you know, I think the more accustomed you get to a particular way and a particular lifestyle, the more dug in you get to yeah, change. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, in, I think about professionally, uh, some of the things I've done where we've tried to implement change, and the hardest thing to do is to convince somebody that change doesn't always have to be bad. You know, the status quo that isn't always acceptable. Sometimes change can be good. Sometimes it can be work out work out for the better. And all you have to do is look around us. And progress takes place sometimes with us, sometimes without us. Sometimes it has to mm-hmm. pull us kicking and screaming. But we have progress. And, and I think that's the important thing to think about when we're talking about uh, things that involve some change. But, but sometimes it could be a benefit to those affected by it. Well, it, it, you're right on the mark, um, and but it is difficult. It yeah, really is. It People is. kind of dig in. I think it's the fear of the unknown. Right. Everybody's afraid of what they don't know or what's lurking behind the curtain. And, and if you think in your own life about sometimes when you've been afraid of something and not sure what was going to happen next, but it turned out to be something spectacular or sensational or something that really kind of added so much yeah. to your quality of life. And, and, and that's kind of what we have to talk to people about and say, listen, uh, it's okay. You know, if it doesn't work, we can adjust it, but let's try something different yeah. uh, in, in order to try and get improvements. Well, Nobody's perfect. And no. we, we, can, we can all improve. We can all improve. Uh, we can I have improve. found the town of Islip in my... I guess my first month. This is the end of uh, January. So, wow, yes. So I have found uh, the town of Islip to be really terrific. The workers are great. It is really well run. Um, and all I am looking to do, if I can, is to add a little something to the dynamic that may improve upon the, upon the process because everything can always improve. Well, you know, I'm going to segue from that to something we had talked about, you know, off offline. Um, but you made reference to it in your volunteer services and everything and your, the fundraising that you do for the special needs community. And I know that has affected you personally in your life. And we at the town reconstituted a disability advisory board about two years ago. Uh, it had not been in place for many years. And um, they are very active and they are very anxious to effectuate change. And we want to work with them. And I'm delighted that you are willing to um, be our voice from the town board with the disability community and uh, work on the disability advisory board. And I know they're going to be delighted to have you there. But uh, yeah, talk about change. I mean, this summer I was running for public office, and in the middle of it, uh, you know, as anybody in the special needs community knows, when your child transitions at the age of 21 from one bureaucratic system, which is the state education department, over to the next level of service mm-hmm. provider, which is um, the Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities. Yes, OMRD. It's, it's really earth shattering because you, you know, Talk they, about change. They, oh yeah, they take away the safety net and you really have to you know, fight and all over again and find new uh, streams for services for your child. So mm-hmm. uh, those who live in that community like I do know what that's like. Uh, hopefully I can add a little bit of empathy and maybe a little personal knowledge to um, what they're going through and, and hopefully help from the town's level uh, on, on maybe some of the things where we can assist the community. Well, I think that's wonderful, and I, I have every faith that you will. I have a little bit of involvement with it, having uh, served um, as the board chair of Catholic Health Services and uh, the uh, Mary uh, Haven um, is a huge organization that services that community and does it very, very well. But it brings that all to mind, and I'm just so thrilled that you're going to be doing that for us here in the town and delighted that you were here with us today on Supervisor Spotlight. Thank you so much, Jim, and good luck. I know you're going to be great. I'm going to try.
you will be good. Yes. <laughs>